most of us who are journalists here, the only sort of great threat we face uh, in our reporting work is perhaps copying the odd lawsuit or being shouted at by the odd cranky politician. Our guest of honour faces a threat level on a much higher and a much graver uh, basis. Anna Nepsova is the Moscow-based correspondent for both Newsweek and The Daily Beast. She's also worked in previous years for The Washington Post and The Guardian. Anna has reported some of the biggest stories in that region in recent years. She covered the 2004 Beslan school siege, that horrible event that saw hundreds of people killed, including, sadly, lots of young children. She's covered the rise and rise and rise of Vladimir Putin over, over many years. And a story, of course, with great impact to a lot of us here. She was one of the first journalists on the scene in the cornfields of eastern Ukraine in the aftermath of the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 in 2014 and uh, had some uh, very compelling, if not grisly, reports from the, the front line there. Anna has been assaulted, detained at gunpoint and repeatedly threatened doing her job as a journalist in an increasingly repressive regime in Russia. In 2015, she was awarded the International Women's Media's Foundation Courage of Journalism Award for her work on terrorism and exposing corruption in Russia, a, a very fertile field to plough in that country. Anna is going to get up and speak for about 20 minutes. She's more than happy to uh, take questions after that. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm Melbourne welcome to Anna Nepsova. Thank you very much. One little correction. Uh, I was held at a gunpoint in what is still Ukraine. It's Eastern Ukraine, not Russia, but um, the rebel-controlled territory backed up by Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for coming here and for your attention. I would like to congratulate Press Council with the 40th anniversary. I would like to thank David and everybody who invited me to come over to Australia. It's always been my dream to visit, and uh, this is the first trip. Uh, hopefully not the last one. I love this country, and I uh, met a lot of very friendly people here. Thank you. <clears throat> so more, more than 15 years ago, when I first started working uh, as a reporter in post-Soviet states, I cared a lot about human rights about human rights stories. And I still think it is important for us news reporters to be witnesses, to hear people's stories, and to report about their troubles. I will tell you how I started covering news in Russia and its uh, neighbors, post-Soviet states. And also about the latest specific difficulties of the field that we experience uh, almost every day, about the changes that we see in Russia. In December 1999, I bought my own ticket to Nazran. That is, a, that is the capital of Ingushetia, a little republic in northern Caucasus, neighboring to Chechnya. At that time, r thousands of refugees uh, were running away from shelling and bombings of um, their hometowns in Chechnya. And we were dozens of reporters coming um, to that region to report the story, and we all believed that we had to see the conflict with our own eyes. Many Chechen civilians lost their homes, their beloved ones, in crossfire in the period from 1999 to 2004. Just the way people lose their homes, family members, in the past two years in Ukraine. Chechen war was the first conflict that I witnessed, that I saw with my own eyes. That winter, Chechen refugees, mothers who lost their children, widows, took us into their tents in the refugee camp. They gave us tea and told us about their troubles. And on the other side of the conflict, Russian officials, uh, Russian military, Russian draftees arriving to the front lines also spoke with us about their fears, expe expectations, about their beliefs. So it was a very clear understanding for both sides of the conflict, for locals, for the military, that we were needed on the field, that we were doing our jobs in Northern Caucasus. In Chechnya, 
I met many experienced journalists, including a heroic photographer, Stanley Green, and a very experienced war reporter, Daniel Williams, who was covering the war for the Washington Post. They were my teachers. And they told me that once when they were young, they also bought their own tickets and they covered their own expenses. They were freelancers and they made their own choices to go. This is partly how many people get into journalism, by making their first steps without an assignment as freelancers, feeling motivated by this important role that we play as witnesses. But the most inspired of us are being stopped. Leaders of former Soviet states, even the most progressive ones, share a common feature. They are easily offended. Men in power, with all the authority given to them, feel vulnerable under the pressure of harsh criticism by the civil society and by press. Criticism is taken as their personal betrayal. They feel betrayed. Once leaders run out of patience, they begin to ban the critics and stop pretending that they are not dictators. And today, the truth is not about the fact-checking and balances, but about defense and attacks. Western media is being portrayed as an attacker. Even President Putin says that Russia is under attack. In Russia, authorities often condemn journalists, independent journalists, who are criticizing the government for having a foreign agenda for being foreign agents. A few years ago, I reported a story in my hometown of Nizhny Novgorod. It is a city with uh, more than one million people population on the Volga River. It is a cultural center in the heart of Russia with 793 years of history, a very old city. And this city is shrinking by 15,000 people a year faster than any other Russian city. So the story I reported uh, was for, for Newsweek magazine. You can read it online today. I asked my home friends, my hometown friends, my former schoolmates, who now work for the administration or for local television, to tell me why they think our hometown had the falling birth rate and why so many people were dying of cancer and heart disease in the last few years. So the answer was, we're not going to talk about this issue for the American press. Are you going to report this for an American publication? No. We don't want the world to know about the troubles. So this is one of the examples of, um, um, that illustrates how much the country is closing down again. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, foreign correspondents were seen as heroes investigating news, pushing for reforms, bringing truth to people. And nobody thought if they were too pro-Russian or too pro-Western, too pro-Ukrainian or too pro-American. Russian respected certain post-perestroika publications. And there were many newspapers and television channel, television programs, let's say, seen as um, the window to uh, democracy. An independent reporter had an image of a positive character in the society. But there is a big change now. What we have in former USSR, including Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, Central Asian countries, is an information war. Authorities often see a reporter not as a storyteller who carries a narrative of current events, but as an information soldier a warrior who is defending the motherland or attacking the motherland. So the information soldier goes to the information war. Today, foreign freelance reporters cannot get an accreditation with Russian foreign ministry. Online publications cannot be accredited either. So about 70% of foreign reporters who would like to work in Russia today, they cannot. A few who tried 
to work without the accreditation have been deported from Russia, and they are seen as two pro-Western uh, agents as propagandists. Kiev authorities do not allow Russian state media reporters to work in Ukraine, demonstrating that the Maidan revolution did not teach this country, uh, let's say, Ukrainian leadership to stay open to criticism. There are many issues with freedom of speech in Ukraine too. Last week, I had a story in Foreign Policy magazine about a Canadian citizen, Savik Schuster, one of the most popular television anchors, presenters that Ukraine has today. Um, Savik was banned from work in Ukraine and he believes that it happened because his shows criticized the leadership for corruption. A few days ago, local reporters were under gunfire in the resort city of Odessa. Back to my country, um, I was researching a story last weekend about uh, a journalist who was murdered in Moscow in his apartment just a few days ago. He was a radio uh, presenter working for radio jazz and uh, sort of entertaining uh, radio channels and he was murdered in his apartment. And to be honest with you, not many people care because the, so many journalists have been killed. Not only reporters are seen as, as soldiers of information war, many of the journalists feel that way themselves. Once, a few years ago, I reported a story for the Chronicle of Higher Education. It's an American newspaper. And I interviewed students at Moscow State University uh, at the Department of Television and Radio. I asked students about their idea of journalism, and one of them told me, I'm here to learn how to defend my motherland. When reporters feel themselves as soldiers defending the Kremlin, the motherland, many acute issues, social issues, are left uncovered. Today, not many Russian journalists go to report stories in Northern Caucasus, in Chechnya, where young Muslims join ISIS, suffer from public pressure, from unemployment. There are many, many stories in Northern Caucasus. Reporters do go, not on, they, 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 do, they, they do not go, not only because it is dangerous from, uh, and it is very dangerous for your safety, but also because by your visits, you endanger your characters, people who speak with you. After you leave and go back to Moscow, people you spoke with, your sources, they're being approached by uh, local officials. So that makes us all wonder, do we still have to cover this very important region of Russia? Or we need to be really, really careful. A few weeks ago, a few journalists coming by minibars and they were reporters from Norway, from Sweden, from Russia. They were attacked by a couple dozen Chechen men in masks, and they were dragged out of that minibus, beaten, and their vehicle was burned down. After that, uh, independent journalists founded a professional union of uh, journalists working in Russia. And within days, they collected money to buy a, a new vehicle for the driver who um, suffered from the attack in Chechnya. But um, it is a question for many of us now whether we can go back after that terrible violence. When I came to this profession, I believed in something, in something different. And I still believe that we go to the field to tell true stories, getting beyond the cliché. I often write profiles, and for that I need to spend hours sit sitting down talking um, with people with my characters. I portrayed leaders in Russia, in Ukraine, and uh, in Georgia, and other post-Soviet post countries. Many times I interviewed Mikhail Saakashvili, the former jo uh, Georgian president. For several years I came back to Georgia to sit down and talk with the president. And he could be very clumsy and very funny. He could pour wine all over himself. He could, you know, throw around pieces of bread and be very untidy. But he was not afraid of showing that uh, to us. He was open to journalists, and reporters still remember how they interviewed him at McDonald's. So that was probably one of the only 
post-Soviet leaders who was so accessible uh, for journalists. We know almost nothing about um, Aliyev, the president of Azerbaijan. I interviewed Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov several times during the past 10 years in his luxurious villas and at his palaces. In Kadyrov's story, we could talk a lot about the abuse of power, human rights abuse, about religious conflict in, Muslim, in, in Muslim republics of Russia. One of the most positive, lighter, sort of entertaining stories was the Olympic Games, uh, which I covered for Australia, for Channel 10, with a great um, Australian journalist. One of them is here, Olivia. We had a lot of fun. And uh, they often ask me, why nobody smiles in your country? And that was probably <laughs> the first question from them. And um, my answer was always, read the news. The same winter, we covered Maidan revolution. And in my part of the world, we had the political crisis as traumatizing as an earthquake. In winter of 2013, 2014, central square of Kiev was on fire. People were killed in a European capital. We could, almost, we could almost hear with our own ears the wall being built between the East and West, dividing not only regions, countries, but also friends and family members into pro-Kiev and pro-Moscow. Into those who supported the annexation of Crimea and those who could never accept it, Eastern European politics became a bloody, horrifying event. Unfortunately, Australia suffered from the crisis too. 38 Australian citizens died in MH17 catastrophe. We were on the field right after the catastrophe. And the people who are really courageous were the, the characters in our stories. For example, the director in an orphanage in Torres where MH17 bodies fell last year. The bodies fell from the sky right in the gar into the garden of the, that orphanage, and children witnessed that. The director of that orphanage evacuated orphans to Ukraine. That is in, uh, important to understand. The airplane fell on the rebel-controlled territory, and she evacuated orphans to Ukraine-controlled territory and came back and spoke with us. So that was very brave. As a freelancer today, I still make my own choices when and where I go. No editors send me places, as unfortunately may, many people in Russia believe. Conflict correspondents risking their lives in the Middle East or in Africa, in Ukraine and other violent places know exactly what they're going into. They take their own risk. It is a big tragedy to lose friends and colleagues to gunfire in conflict zones. It is even a bigger tragedy, and, some t and, and, it, and it is a shame to see some of our friends being shot down, gunned down in peaceful cities. I want to use this chance to remember my colleagues, Anna Politkovska, who was gunned down in Moscow, Natalia Stimirova, and Anastasia Baburova, and other reporters who felt victims of assassinations for journalism. I would also like to send my love and my support to Hadisha Ismailova, also a recipi re recipient, I'm sorry, jet lag, <laughs> of IWMF award for courage, like me, who was jailed for seven and a half years last year in Azerbaijan for a politically motivated case, she thinks. She believes that she was jailed for um, covering corruption state corruption. I would like to address leaders of post-Soviet states, if they see me, as I, I, I can see there is a video camera. Please protect your reporters, even if they dig out information that discredits you. They are doing their job. They are witnesses of your rule. We, Anna, have this um, fascination, this grim fascination here in Australia, and I'm sure lots of people around the world have it as well with Vladimir Putin. 
whether he's crushing dissent or posing for those action man shots, bare-chested, wrestling tigers, scuba diving, whatever. Where's it going to end for him? Do you, would he like to be president for life? How do, you, how do you see the political situation unfolding? At least for one more term, which is now six years. It used to be four. And that's it? Uh, let's see how he feels. But it's interesting that that bare, bare chest and the horse uh, was something that people really remembered. I think much more on the West so than uh, at home. I don't think that Russian men paid attention too much to that uh, photo session. But on the West, uh, definitely. Everybody's asking me about that particular photo session <laughs> that he had. And what did you think of it? Well... I, I, you know, I still debate with myself what sort of example it was. Um, it was interesting that I think the shoes that uh, Vladimir Putin was wearing that day were military shoes, um, but he, they were hiking and riding horses out somewhere in the in the taiga or in Altai Mountains. Um, maybe he inspired Russians to be a little bit more outgoing and sporty. That was definitely uh, on the agenda to take. Um, the men out of the bars, because uh, many Russian men do drink and they die very young, average 59, that's very young, because um, maybe we are turning from a vodka drinking country into beer drinking country now, but uh, people definitely like booze still. Uh, questions, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Simon Hi. Love from Channel 7. Nice uh, to hear. I want to ask you more about Vladimir Putin. Two years ago, the Australian Prime, well, the then Prime, uh, Australian Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, uh, promised to shirt front uh, Vladimir Putin. And that was a big comment that went national around this nation. I'm just wondering, did it have much reaction over in Russia and in the region at all? And from your opinion, was it surprising to see such a prominent uh, Western leader challenge Putin at all? That was the news for, for a couple of days uh, and people talked about it. But um, we're very sort of close country in a way that Russians really think about what's going on at home more. It's the same case in the United States. It is a syndrome of a huge country. It's the biggest country in the world and uh, every city is different. So uh, what politicians say is not uh, necessarily on people's mind. And um, I'm, I'm curious about the, the current situation, if the current leadership in Australia also make comments about Putin or not, because uh, I haven't heard anything since then. But uh, my answer is that it was on the news for one, two days only. Professor, please. Um. Thank you. I just wondered if you could uh, briefly give us a basic outline of the instruments that the Russian government has to control and influence the media from ownership, etc. Thank you. Well, see, I, I never worked for um, Russian media much. I freelanced for a couple of publications. Um, I'm a freelancer and I sympathize with uh, my colleagues who work for state-controlled media. Every day they're being told what to, to, to publish and what to cover. Um, and here's how it works. Um, every week, uh, chief editors of major publications and television channels are being briefed by uh, Vladimir Putin's press secretary, and they decide which newspaper covers which news. We had a few um, very popular publications being closed by authorities, and one of them was an online news uh, publication called Lenta. Uh, there were more than 100 reporters working for that publication. And the day their chief editor was fired, most of the reporters got off their chairs and left the newsroom. And they moved to Latvia. And they founded uh, an independent news medium called Meduza. So this is an example of how reporters deal with, um, with current situations. Some of them uh, compromise and they stay and do what they're told to do and some of them uh, work for online publications there are many of them and there are still a few independent print uh, publications too so it's not the, uh, totally hopeless there there are independent reporters in Russia 
Uh, Anna, I was very fortunate to hear your sessions in Sydney. Thank you. Uh, and I was particularly interested to hear your remarks about the uh, forthcoming United States presidential election. And I think you said that um, there's a surprising level of popularity, or perhaps unsurprising level of popularity for uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, if indeed uh, he were to win the election, what do you think that would mean for the relationship between the US and, the, and, uh, and Russia? I did a story about that, um, about how much he's popular, popular in Russia and how Russians compare Trump to uh, also a very controversial figure in Russian politics, uh, Mr. Zhirinovsky. He's a parliament member who says all sorts of uh, controversial things and some people say he's a clown, he's amusing, but some of the statements are extremely scary. Um, but see, with men especially, it's, it's interesting that women are not as much interested in being an empire or being important in the world, but I think men much more so. Um, they look at Trump and they respect him for saying whatever he wants, no matter what other people think, and no matter how much criticism he hears in mainstream American uh, media, he continues to say what he thinks. But recently he said that um, if Russian airplanes violate uh, foreign territories, uh, they, they should be brought down, this is an unpopular statement, and I don't think that puts him appreciated that so much. Thank you. Anna, thank you. Aaron Young from Sky News. I should preface this by saying I worked for Russia today 10 years ago, was hired by Margarita Simonian uh, as one of the first to move over. And so many people left, uh, foreign journalists, and I was one of them after 10 months as we suddenly realized we'd become part of the information war. One of the things that I couldn't help notice as an Australian journalist who likes to ask a lot of questions was talking to the everyday man as we do. They looked at Gorbachev uh, as someone who was a traitor, perhaps owned by the CIA. They looked at uh, Yeltsin as a drunk and they loved Putin because he was a strong man. Walking down Novi Arbat, you'd notice that there were so many uh, souvenirs of Stalin, a man who had killed so many people. And I started to wonder to myself, are the Russian people complicit in having a leader like Putin. As a journalist in Australia, you feel that the public has your back, that they want you to be reporting and to be uncovering the truth. As you mentioned, that used to be the case. Do you think that the people of Russia have some answering, or do you think that they really are being held back? This is a very, very painful and good, strong, powerful question. Thank you. Um, I personally believe that uh, my personal morality, my morale, has never changed. I, from the beginning, as I told you, I thought that it was important to go and be witness of what was going on. So that narrative needs to be um, brought to you guys here to Australia so you would be able to read my stories. And um, for, for many people in Russia, the values are very confusing right now. Just before coming here, there was, I heard a terrible thing happen uh, and published a story about it uh, to high schoolers who were coming from all over Russia, from Russian regions, to write um, their compositions about their relatives who were victims of Stalin Stalinism, of Stalin repressions. And they were attacked, those kids and their teachers and um, the jury of the contest. They were attacked by nationalists. Um, who were expecting them outside the door, threw eggs at them, shouted terrible things, and police did not stop that. So that is um, very, very sad. But I, uh, you know, I, I try not to, to see these comments about being traitor. Um, this is something maybe temporary because things are so intense and Russians feel like the Cold War is on the way or it's taking place right now. I believe that uh, people in Russia deserve democracy and they're very intelligent, very well educated. Um, and one day they will figure it out. Anna, Cindy, Christian. Um, <clears throat> outside of Russia, there's a lot of publicity regarding Putin and his wealth. Um, recently, there were the Panama Papers. Is there much discussion of that within Russia? Is it in the newspapers? Is it in the media? Is it a concern for the Russian people? Yes, it was in the media a lot. 
and um, Putin's best friend, uh, his closest friend, who uh, happened to be part of the Panama Papers um, investigation, a celloist, a uh, musician, um, was on the most popular uh, state ch uh, channel, television channel. There was a big show uh, about him and how he made money, what he spent the money on. So they totally deny the corrupt element in that story, and that is the Kremlin's position, that once again, uh, it was an attack on Russia, on Russian leadership, and the Russian officials, if you interview them, are convinced that uh, Washington is coming to um, kick Putin out of the Kremlin, and the president, legitimate president, elected by Russians, is being under attack by United States. And that is what the majority of people see and believe in. Well, sorry, while we uh, wait for the next question, I sort of take you back to the, the fields of eastern Ukraine after MH17 came down. A lot of Australian journalists on the scene uh, said it was a very tough assignment, but also very dangerous because it was a war zone. On one side, there were the Ukrainian forces. On the other, the pro-Russian militia. Just recount how challenging it was for you as, as, as a journalist trying to get the facts on this enormous tragedy while dealing with personal safety at the same time. Thank you for the question. Actually, uh, one day, one of the most dangerous days, I was uh, working with Australian journalists, uh, with a photographer and writer, and the day began from a coffee uh, on a sunny day. Then shelling began, uh, started in Donetsk, and the district of um, apartment buildings, I'm sorry, was under fire, artillery fire, and under rockets, uh, this multiple rocket launcher called Grad, you, you might be familiar with it. Uh, it's a very old Soviet weapon. So we were three people running around that courtyard and we documented um, a victim after victim. We actually saw a woman of my age who lost her head um, that day. And then we were in the basement we were full of people. It was a school basement where all the locals, locals rushed to hide. A very good uh, deep basement. And in that basement, there were two groups of people. Some were yelling, I, I wish a Ukrainian army came and took over Donetsk again. And some were saying, oh, we want this to be part of Russia. We want Russian army to move in and defend us. Um, and as soon as they saw a big lens uh, of an Australian uh, photographer, they all, both groups attacked the photographer because they didn't want to be photographed. People in stressful situations um, react in different ways. And when the plane um, collapsed on their villages, it's a big area actually where people still live. You know, we journalists, we go to the field, we cover our stories and then we go back home. But people who are actually living there, they stay. And they, day after day, live with memories of that terrible catastrophe. You cannot blame them for telling you sometimes the most ridiculous things. We, covering this war, by the way, Ukrainian conflict was the least favorite story. Everybody lied to us. Ukrainian officials were not saying the truth. Russian officials were not saying the truth. Rebels were not saying the truth. So what do you do? You can only go yourself and see with your own eyes. Try to see as much as possible with your own eyes. For instance, one of the myths uh, that we heard was that passengers were put on the plane, MH17 plane, already dead and naked. So that was one of the stories I heard from, from, from locals. They did not believe that it was. Um, oh. So you don't know where to start. So it, it is very, very difficult. Every day you need to report the story, be on the field and then rush to the hotel to the nearest coffee shop that has Wi-Fi and, and file the story. And that's how your days go non-stop. Uh, Ann Burroughs, former freelancer, and I know the joys of choosing your own subject and finding a, an editor who knows your strengths. But what concerns me is your security. and I'm, in the flyer that I got, it said you'd been very badly treated, presumably by the government. Um, could you tell us something about that and tell me how easy is it for you to go in and out of Russia? 
I was never badly treated by the government. Um, th the only problem is that they don't accredit me because I'm not uh, a staff correspondent. I'm a freelance, just like you. So freelancers do not have, as we say in Russian, the roof. All we have is our pen and paper, and, and we go. So when we get in trouble, and I got in trouble at checkpoints in eastern Ukraine uh, when I was covering um, the war, anybody could be in trouble just like me because um, some men are at the checkpoints are armed and drunk after 5 p.m. And then they see the women in the car, and one of them in, uh, in, in the first case was American. So they lifted us and they took our cell phones away from us and drove us in some unknown direction. That was the first abduction. It's a classical abduction. I, I reported on abductions for years in Northern Caucasus. Um, and the second time, we were looking for uh, MH17 victims. We were looking for the bodies because uh, the day earlier, rebels collected the remains and uh, put them in some plastic bags took in a known direction. We did not know where some of the bodies were, and we came to the morgue that day, um, and immediately, as soon as we arrived, uh, there were guns to our heads, and we were put in a different car and taken to prison for questioning. And both times, there were women, you know, women reporters. That's another element. Uh, Kevin Lawbury, Anna, uh, Kevin Lawbury, freelance. Um, just a couple of sort of a, a twin question. Why did you become a journalist? Do you have a background, your father or someone, that, uh, that impelled you to go that way? And do you think, because of your connections with the West, that Putin is in some ways afraid of you? Thank you for the questions. Yes, my father is a journalist and he worked for a Soviet newspaper called Pravda. I grew up uh, in the newsroom and always respected journalists. Um, they had a door on the floor. Um, he was a news reporter working for um, the department of the newspaper called News. <laughs> so, and there was also a door that said censorship. All his articles had to pass through uh, not only editors editing, but uh, also through the hands of the censor. But I had great respect for, for the profession. And my husband is a journalist working for the New York Times uh, in Russia. He was just recently in Syria covering um, a big concert in Palmyra. You, you, you guys probably saw that on television. It was big news. We do have it in the family. And um, the second question was whether uh, the president is afraid of us. Um, I don't think the president even reads as much, uh, but to be honest with you, I don't think um, we are important. Um, during annual press conferences, when Vladimir Putin answers questions for four hours sometimes, uh, it's a very rare case when a foreign journalist, foreign correspondent can uh, un ask a question. Hello, thank you, Di Rule. Um, I was just interested listening to you on radio to hear about the number of women or extra women that there are in Russia and I was just wondering if you'd give us a bit of an idea about how it is as a female Russian journalist. How it is in? As a female. As a female. Journal. Well, the, as I said on ABC this morning, it's, it's one of my favourite stories. I uh, think that talking about Russian women, you can understand a lot about Russia, reading about Russian women. There are 11 million, or around 11 million more women than men in Russia. It's very different from China, for instance. And um, women live about seven years longer than men, which is a unique gap for Europe. Uh, many women are single. They're looking for men. They're interested in um, getting married with foreigners. You find Russian wives in... Morocco and Turkey. I was recently reporting in Istanbul uh, about Russian-Turkish marriages, Russian wife and the Turkish husband, and that works perfectly. Uh, they are all happy, and there are thousands of these cases. So um, that is a story, and uh, it is also a story to um, to think about domestic violence 
It is very, very big in Russia and probably on the number of victims, um, Russia is number one in Europe, the leader, unfortunately. And one of the stories I wrote for Newsweek um, a few years ago was about my school friend, Lena, who was uh, murdered by her husband. And that's why I became so interested and, and I thought it was important to devote stories about domestic violence to Lena. And it turned out um, that in that particular city and in many Russian cities, there were no shelters for women and children to run to from, from violence at home. In Moscow, there is one. So that gives you a picture. Um, you, you mentioned the Russian women reporter. Um, you know, we don't really distinguish between men and women. We, we think that reporters have the same role. It doesn't really matter what gender you are. Hello. Sorry, I could ask so many questions. Aaron from Sky again. Um, you mentioned the number of journalists who have been killed. Uh, you mentioned Anna, uh, I won't dare try and pronounce her surname. Politkovska. Thank you, easy for you to say. Uh, and also, uh, there was the editor of the Forbes magazine who was also killed, apparently, because he put someone in the top 500 list who was meant to be higher than they put in the list, so he was killed. Um, do you think that the, uh, and, and as a Russian journalist, do you find that you self-censor? Do you think that uh, journalists are no, want, no longer wanting to ask the tough questions? Do you think that there are enough people like yourself or do you think that there are more people like myself who return home to Australia? I think there are quite a few great journalists in Russia working for independent media. And they, they, this uh, sort of online publications are being born all the time. I see more and more of them coming and uh, their readership is not huge, but uh, let's say hipster community, this Russian, uh, Russians in St. Petersburg and Moscow in Siberia and big cities who are living online, reading Twitter and Facebook every day, they are very much um, updated about what's going on. And uh, I admire uh, Russian reporters' work. I think they're, they're great. And um, the, the, the choices are easily made. You basically, if you're excited and curious, and you want to tell the story, and you see that this is a very important and interesting story to tell, you can see you working, right? That is your choice. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. We've got time for perhaps one more before we wrap up. Hi, Alex Messina. Hi. I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing your view of uh, the media and reporting from a Russian perspective, uh, particularly your view of American reporting of the world, not only domestic. Uh, do you see differences? Thank you. Uh, now, now I remember, I'm sorry, what I didn't answer is, is about self-censorship. Uh, yes, we do self-censor ourselves now because we self-censor we, we self <laughs> because we are worried about our characters, about our sources very much. I do not want people to lose their jobs or be abducted after I go home. So um, I noticed that lately I've been very cautious, uh, making sure that the person is comfortable to talk on the record, giving me name. Um, so this is uh, th this is a problem. As for American publications, it's hard for me to say because I, I work for American publications. I, I report mostly for the Daily Beast, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, Politico, and um, my editors are great. Most of them are reporters. Uh, my editor at the Daily Beast uh, is Chris Dickey, who uh, was uh, Newsweek's best war reporter. So he knows exactly what's going on and what, what it feels like. And um, so I feel the shelter of a uh, former correspondent. He reports stories now. I just read his amazing piece on the Daily Beast about um, uh, slavery from Tiny Z. And it was written in sort of Cold War, Truman Capote's style. A uh, great piece to read. Lovely, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big warm thanks to Anna Nepsova. Thank you very much. Thank you. And can I ask to come to the stage David Weisbrough from the Press Council to offer a more formal vote of thanks. David. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I think this is the third event uh, in under a year that the Australian Press Council uh, has operated in association with the Melbourne Press Club. It's a beautiful relationship that's developing and I think a very productive one into the future. 
Uh, we're trying to um, move the press council away from its old role as the cup on the beat to part of a shared enterprise in which we value high and promote high standards of journalism and we all fight the good fight for press freedom here and abroad. So we were thrilled when uh, Mark and his team proposed to have Anna Nemtsova come down and speak to you. Uh, she was uh, an absolute star of our press freedom conference in Sydney and uh, we're glad she, she certainly has more stamina and, and a longer lasting voice uh, than I do. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that. I'd like you to put your hands together again for one of the most uh, courageous and effective journalists in the world, Anna Nemtsova. Thank you.